It's fair to say that the NES Mini was a huge success, but one ultimately limited by the low quantity shipped to stores. Of course, even if you did find one, the experience was still marred by flaws, including subpar video scaling, minor emulation issues, and ultra-short controller cords. Now, with its latest miniaturized system then, Nintendo is taking a second stab at the Mini concept, and this time, it's brought along some key improvements. Several issues we had with the NES Mini have been addressed this time around, yet new ones have also been introduced. With the limited power of a system on a chip in a box, can we really expect accurate emulation here? After all, the SNES Mini marks the very first time Nintendo has offered an official emulation solution for Super FX chip games like Yoshi's Island. With so many chips to emulate, can this little box truly offer an experience that retro enthusiasts will be happy with? Today, then, we're going to explore the Super NES Mini's new features, its improvements, and its minor shortcomings. Beyond that, we're also going to take a closer look at the finished version of Star Fox 2, reflect on some of the system's most impressive titles, check out some alternative controllers, and even look at a more affordable upscaling option for those that prefer real hardware. All that and more is coming up on this episode of DF Retro. The Super NES is Nintendo's second major home console, and even today boasts one of the best lineups to ever grace a piece of gaming hardware. Even as a diehard Sega fan, I can't deny it, the Super NES is an amazing console. It's also hardware that is decidedly different from the competition at the time, with support for an expanded color palette, advanced sample-based sound chip, and rich tile manipulation features, the Super NES offers capabilities that no other competing system could match, despite its slow CPU. Then there's the design of the console itself. The original Super Famicom is a beautiful machine, and this design is shared with the European model. Now, the North American unit, however, features a different design that many would argue is less attractive. Now, I still have nostalgia for the old Purple Beast, but it's difficult to deny the beauty of the European and Japanese models. Like the NES Mini before, then the miniaturized Super NES comes in three different shells, with designs corresponding to that of the original units in each territory. We're looking at the European version of the system today, and it's not difficult to be impressed by the attention to detail. Every little ridge and bump is captured perfectly in its design. In addition, the Super NES Mini includes two controllers this time around, and both controllers feature slightly longer cables, an improvement over its predecessor. Like last year's model, the controllers perfectly replicate the look and feel of the original pads. The beautiful candy-colored buttons really stand out, and the D-pad feels spot on. Of course, like the original, the European and Japanese models lack the concave X and Y buttons of the American pad, but the color choices more than make up for it. If the cord is still too short for you, it's also possible to pick up 8-Bit Doe's retro receiver designed for the NES Mini. Now, I've been testing several 8-Bit Doe controllers and have been suitably impressed. Now, the D-pad sometimes registers more down presses than I'd like, but the overall feeling is that it's otherwise on par with a real controller. You can even buy a receiver to use it with a real Super NES and pair it with your Switch or any Bluetooth-capable device. In that sense, it's a highly recommended upgrade and one that is useful across a wide range of systems. At its core then, the SNES Mini is based in the same all-winner R16 system on a chip featured in the NES Mini. But while Nintendo's European research and development team has implemented a host of new features, it also comes with some of the same drawbacks as the original. Like its predecessor, the Mini SNES is limited to just 720p output. Now, the base resolution for most SNES games is equivalent to the NES at just 256 by 224 It's a logical choice since 224 perfectly scales up to 720 In a dream world, the system on a chip could support 4K output, which is perfect for scaling low-resolution content due to its high pixel count, but alas, we're stuck with 720p. One nice change for the European version, though, can be found in its ROM selection. 
Each included ROM is taken from the American release, and as such, they all run at 60Hz instead of 50Hz, as we've seen in the past with many virtual console releases. Which means you'll be playing Contra 3 on the SNES Mini rather than Super Pro Protector. But there is some good news when it comes to video output. So, once again, yes, the system does offer three different output options. A pixel perfect mode, a 4x3 aspect ratio mode, and a CRT filter. In addition, a selection of borders have been added to the mix if you prefer, and many of them are quite tasteful indeed. And this is where we run into one of the first major improvements over the NES Mini. The scaling has been improved. In particular, the 4x3 option now manages to avoid the scaling and crawling artifacts that plague the NES Mini. The issue stems from the horizontal resolution. On a CRT, which doesn't rely on a fixed pixel grid, the narrow aspect ratio of the SNES is smoothly stretched to fill a 4x3 display, resulting in non-square pixels. On a fixed pixel display, however, this can introduce artifacts while scrolling, creating visible shimmering, which was an issue on the NES Mini. For the Super NES Mini, however, the team has implemented a very subtle interpolation feature which still preserves its sharp pixels, but minimizes the issue. You can see now that while scrolling there is no shimmering or distortion visible here when using the 4x3 mode. This improvement alone is a huge deal and makes the 4x3 mode much more pleasant to use. So how about the pixel perfect mode then? Well this one uses square pixels resulting in an 8x7 aspect ratio. Now this isn't how the games were meant to be played, but there are arguments in favor of it. The Morph Ball in Super Metroid for instance appears completely round in 8x7, but more as an oval in 4x3. The benefit here is of course that there is no interpolation necessary. It's certainly a nice option to have. Lastly, there's the CRT filter, and this one I'm not a huge fan of. Now the NES Mini does a reasonable job of presenting an image that looks similar to a CRT, at least one using composite video. For the SNES Mini however, the composite video artifacts are gone, which is a good thing, but in its place is a blurry filtered image with faint scan lines. If we compare this to a real CRT, in this case a Sony PVM monitor, you can see how far it falls. The CRT offers razor sharp scan lines with a subtle pixel fall off around edges due to the phosphor nature of the display. In comparison, the SNES Mini option just looks blurry. It lacks the clarity and definition of a real CRT, and thus it doesn't really match up to what you'd expect from a proper CRT filter. Now, for most of the comparisons in this video then, we're using a late generation one chip model. For those unfamiliar with it then, the later models of the Super NES console featured a unified design to reduce manufacturing costs, and it turns out that these models can produce a sharper picture compared to the older two chip design. The one chip produces a very sharp and clean image, and in fact, also highlights another issue with the SNES Mini, video noise. Now it's a little difficult to see it here in a compressed video of course, but essentially there is visible noise present throughout the image that appears in solid colors. For a digital device you wouldn't expect this at all, but it's there. What's surprising is that the one chip Super NES puts out a cleaner image using analog RGB cables. You wouldn't expect that with digital versus analog. Overall though, video output is pretty good, and it is improved over the NES Mini thanks to enhanced 4x3 scaling, but the video noise and poorly implemented CRT filter keep the system from achieving perfection. So how about the emulation itself? Well, visually speaking, Nintendo has done a pretty good job here. The visuals are accurate to real hardware overall, and superior to the Super NES emulation used for virtual console releases. Many of the included games contain special chips, which places further demand on the emulation software. Kirby Superstar and Mario RPG, for instance, use the Super Accelerator 1 or SA1 chip, Mario Kart uses the DSP1, and several other included games make use of the Super FX chip. And this is an important breakthrough too, since Nintendo has avoided emulating the Super FX chip on the virtual console service. With the Super NES Mini, however, Nintendo has included three games utilizing this technology. The original Star Fox, which makes use of the first Super FX chip, while Yoshi's Island 2 and Star Fox 2 employ the Super FX GSU-2. Emulation seems excellent overall with various complex effects displaying just as you'd expect in each of these games. The one exception I noticed is this background issue with Yoshi's Island. Touch of fuzzy and the background briefly disappears. On real hardware, it doesn't happen like that. 
Now it has been theorized that this is related to the anti-seizure measures included with the system, but I'm not entirely sure that's the case here, as the flashing present on the Mini is more distracting here. To see the anti-seizure technique in action though, just play Contra 3. When using the bomb in the original version, a screen filling transparent circle explodes from your character until the screen flashes white. On the Mini, the effect looks more like this instead. We see this kind of thing across several different games with similar effects. Another interesting observation can be found with the Mode 7 scaling effects. Check out Kirby in this shot. On the Mini, the pixel edges are more defined and appear to be rendered at a higher resolution than on real hardware. Similar to the high-res Mode 7 option featured in several emulators, perhaps. Kirby also exhibits minor performance differences with the slowdown reduced in select sequences. Overall though, emulation is quite serviceable in this case. With this small system on a chip, you're never going to get high gan like accuracy here, but overall it works really well. But what about the audio? Now this is a tough one. For the most part, sound emulation is solid and more accurate than what we saw with the NES Mini, but it's not quite perfect. We noticed occasional missing sound effects or subtle differences in music playback, but it's difficult to say if some of these issues are just down to the way the software is programmed. On the right speakers though, you can definitely hear a minor difference in the way music playback is handled with certain games. Long sustained notes are just slightly harsher on the SNES Mini. Now, there's also a very slight delay in audio playback. Unlike the NES Mini, it's not something you're likely to notice in practice, but based on close analysis of the waveform, it does seem that the SNES Mini delays sound playback by roughly three frames compared to real hardware, which again is still an improvement over the NES Mini, but it's not perfect. Okay, so thus far we have improved 4x3 scaling, reasonably accurate emulation, and good sound. It's an improvement over the NES Mini in all these areas. But what about the features included in the device itself? Well, like the NES Mini, save states are available, but there's another nifty feature included as well, a rewind function. Simply pop down to the save selection screen, then hit the rewind button. From there, you can use the R and L buttons to move between the last minute of gameplay or so. If you made an error and want to recover, it's possible. It's definitely a nice little feature for sure. As for the rest of the options, well, it should be familiar to anyone that's used an S Mini before, and the overall UI is still excellent. One last aspect of the hardware to discuss is input latency. Due to the nature of the hardware, there is going to be at least slightly more input latency compared to a real Super NES on a CRT. The hardware has to draw to a frame buffer for one thing, which adds lag to the chain, but really the unit itself is still relatively fast. The main issue here is less about the SNES Mini itself and more about the end-to-end -end latency. When playing on a CRT, the response in these games is incredibly precise, but once you throw in a frame or two from the Mini and couple that with additional frames of latency caused by the TV itself, it can start to feel a bit mushy. The main display I'm using has 27 milliseconds of input latency, which is less than two frames. So when taken together with the Mini, it's still likely less than three frames overall, but some TVs are slower than this and it can impact playability. Just something to consider when jumping into one of these units. All right, let's talk about some of the games then, shall we? I want to start with one of my favorites, Contra 3 The Alien Wars. I sunk a huge amount of time into this game when I was younger, and I still enjoy blasting through it today. If you consider the time frame when this was released, it's an early Super NES game, I think it's doing some very interesting things with the SNES hardware. For one thing, we see copious amounts of transparency used throughout. From the bombs, to the fire in this stage, it's a cool technique that is not possible on competing machines at the time. It also makes great use of Mode 7 scaling. Sure, the plane in this scene is awesome enough, but these overhead stages were quite novel at the time, plus the scaling of this boss, very cool. Now I know some folks aren't a huge fan of these overhead stages, but I actually think they work well here. Contra was always about breaking up every other stage with a new perspective, and that extends to Contra 3. Once you get the hang of it, it's easy to handle and a ton of fun. Being able to rotate the perspective like this was quite novel at the time and it looks great here. 
the game also makes great use of parallax scrolling, providing an extra layer of depth in many scenes. The level design itself is also top-notch, with tons of variety in every stage. Plus, the bosses are huge and impressive to behold. Then there's the sound. Now, Contra 3 is not the type of soundtrack that bursts with catchy melodies. Rather, it goes for something much more foreboding and ambient. It uses samples to create a rich canvas of sound that helps build atmosphere. Take a listen. Okay, I admit it, Contra 3 is not a technical tour de force, but I think it makes smart use of the SNES hardware to produce a beautifully realized version of Contra. This was still during the early days of 16-bit hardware, so it was great seeing new next-generation takes on classic NES games. And Contra 3 nails it. F-Zero is another interesting one with a strong legacy. It's a series that doesn't always get the respect it deserves, but the original F-Zero is a fantastic game, especially for its time. Launching alongside the Super NES, F-Zero showcases the potential of Mode 7, with fully rotating and scalable tracks. It's essentially a large flat tile map that can be scaled and rotated in real time, but the sensation of racing across the landscape at high speed was fully realized, and it's played in full screen. It's really the blistering frame rate that defines this one. Console racing games up until this point were typically rather sluggish, but F-Zero operates at a perfect 60 frames per second. This was expanded in Super Mario Kart then, this time exploiting the DSP-1 chip. Mario Kart supports two-player split-screen, which was rather novel at the time, and supports scalable objects, along with more complex Mode 7 tracks. It's ultimately a rather flat game, but it's still impressive to see how much detail was crammed into the rather limited tile maps offered by Mode 7. You can see why the DSP-1 chip was required here. Next up is Yoshi's Island. Now, I spoke about this in a previous episode, but I want to quickly highlight some of its impressive features once again. As one of the later releases for the Super NES, Yoshi's Island makes use of the Super FX2 chip, offering visuals that greatly exceed what should have been possible in the system. Scaling and rotation are used regularly here, 3D objects are integrated seamlessly into the world, enemies feature huge numbers of animation frames, and the parallax backgrounds are incredibly rich and detailed. In many ways, it feels like a game designed for the PlayStation or Saturn going well beyond its 16-bit roots. That very same Super FX2 chip then serves as the basis for another major release in this package, Star Fox 2. This is an important release. It's well known that Star Fox 2 was canceled just prior to its ship date, likely in response to the more powerful 3D consoles at the time and the upcoming N64. And for preservationists, it's great to see a final version of the game finally made available. Now, Star Fox 2 is one of the most ambitious games created for the 16-bit machine. As I mentioned, it's built with the Super FX GSU-2 and offers more complex 3D environments than anything the original Star Fox could offer. In a way, Star Fox 2 is kind of a rogue light in that you face impending death at all times and are forced to deal with whatever comes your way in order to reach the end. You'll intercept enemies on the map, go into large carriers and take them down, and even fly down onto planet surfaces. And it's here where things become really impressive. Once planet side, you can toggle between an R-wing and a bipedal mech of sorts. These maps allow players to run freely around the environment shooting enemies, hitting switches, and attacking buildings. Then you make your way inside, survive an onslaught of enemies, and take down a central core before essentially saving the planet. Each of these levels have actual elevation changes thanks to polygons and more advanced collision. In some ways, it almost feels as if a game like MechWarrior 2 from the PC could have been ported over to the Super NES without losing too much of the original feel. Sure, it would be low resolution and rather choppy, but the basic concept seems feasible thanks to Star Fox 2. The size and complexity of its enemies also cannot be understated. 
The Mirage Dragon is an imposing segmented beast with fluid animation. And the same goes for this rather bizarre boss battle in which a texture of Andross is drawn around a floating cube that transforms into a weird face. I suppose including textures like this was a novelty at the time, but it is really strange. But when you combine it with this background here, it does feel like some sort of prototype N64 game in many ways, and that kind of applies to the game as a whole, really. But there is a downside. As you can plainly see, the frame rate is not very smooth. It's a choppy game, not unlike other Super FX 3D titles, but it does make it hard to enjoy at times. It isn't unplayable, but it can be borderline. Still, it's amazing to see what the development team was able to accomplish on this little machine. But before we continue, it's time for the Digital Foundry Minute, Minute, Minute. Okay, so let's say you still have an original Super NES and are looking for a way to play it on your flat panel TV. Now, the XRGB Framemeister has become well known since its release for this type of thing, but over the last couple of years, a challenger has appeared at a much more reasonable price. The Open Source Scan Converter, or OSSC. This is in fact a scan converter, as the name implies, and it's designed to convert analog RGB, or component video signals, to digital, which can then be enjoyed on a modern display. The OSSC does not use on-screen menus, instead relying on a small LCD screen embedded into the unit. And it lacks some of the features available on the Framemeister, but, but it's ultimately a great way to enjoy 240p content on a modern TV. The unit supports line doubling, tripling, quadrupling, or even a line 5x mode, if your display supports it, of course. The key here is that, as a scan converter, the OSSC is fast. An upscaler like the Framemeister requires a frame buffer, which adds roughly one frame of lag into the mix. The OSSC, on the other hand, is much faster, and more importantly, it's much cheaper. It sells for £160 and supports any analog console you might throw at it, provided you're using one of its available inputs. Yes, it is definitely more expensive than something like the SNES Mini, but it's much more versatile. If you've ever had interest in a unit like the Framemeister, but didn't want to cough up the cash then, the OSSC is a much more affordable product and is in fact still being manufactured today, though the quantities are still relatively limited. I think that this is a great way to play retro games on a modern TV using original hardware. So give it a look. Now back to the show. The next two games I want to mention are those that use the SA1 chip, Super Mario RPG and Kirby Superstar, but there's a catch. Neither of these games really take advantage of what the SA-1 has to offer. The SA-1 is a coprocessor capable of speeds four times that of the stock system, while providing programmers with more memory to work with and many other features. What's amazing here is that the chip has been used by homebrew coders since its release to create amazing things like these 3D demos. This is all done using the SA-1 as opposed to, say, the Super FX chip, suggesting that it was indeed a very capable chip. Looking over the entire SNES library, however, it would seem that no game really took advantage of what the SA-1 offers. So why even include them in games like this? Well, copy protection is one guess, but also faster decompression of assets perhaps? Or maybe just improving performance due to the weak CPU in the Super NES? It's tough to say, and that's a disappointing thing to consider as the SA-1 really does seem very capable. Now, that's not to say that Kirby and Mario RPG aren't nice looking games. They both go for that 3D SGI look, but it works pretty well, and they are high-end Super NES games. But really, it leaves us wondering what could have been. Now, before we close up this episode, I want to end with one more segment here, focusing on great music for the system. So how about a little musical showcase then? The SPC700 was a unique audio chip for the time, and while it has its flaws, plenty of developers made it sing. Right from launch, we had Super Mario World with its understated but incredibly catchy score. And the neat thing about it is that they added a drum track when you were riding Yoshi. If you got hit and lost him though, it sounded like this. Not long after, Konami went all out with its games, and Castlevania IV really showcased what the Super NES could do, by introducing a more ambient score that takes advantage of the sample-based nature of the system.
David Wise and Rare, of course, were masters of the Super NES audio hardware, and Donkey Kong Country sounds unlike anything else at the time. Then, of course, there's Star Fox, which features one of the best soundtracks of the generation. From the opening theme on Corneria... ...to the eerie boss introduction during the same stage. Great stuff. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past hasn't received much of a mention in this episode, but it still remains one of my favorite Zelda titles. It also has an incredible soundtrack. Super Metroid as well, you just can't go wrong with it. And I certainly enjoy the way Kirby Superstar uses ambient noise in some sections. Then of course there's Secret of Mana, a game originally designed for the Super NES CD attachment. Impressively, it still makes great use of the audio chip. Speaking of the CD attachment, the homebrew scene has also discovered ways to take advantage of the MSU-1, enabling real CD audio tracks in Super NES games. Now I obviously won't share the details in this video on how to do it, but needless to say the results are really cool. But of course, developers were still doing plenty of great things with the sound chip itself. Earthbound is one example I certainly cannot forget. Not to mention Final Fantasy III, which features some of the most impressively complex music on the system. Honestly, just about every game included on the SNES Mini features a great soundtrack, and it's one of those elements that makes it so easy to return to these titles. Music is a strong point for the system. And with that, we've reached the end of this hardware-focused episode. Like the NES Mini before it, Nintendo's miniature Super NES is basically an emulator in a box, housed inside a beautiful little shell. What separates this from the rest of the chaff, however, lies in its execution. No, it's not perfect, mind you, but compared to what other companies like At Games are providing, or even clone systems like Hyperkin, well, it's difficult to argue with the results here. Ultimately, I still do prefer playing on real hardware, primarily due to the benefits of a CRT display. Games are just more responsive and look nicer. But if you're looking for something more portable and friendly for your modern TV, though, the SNES Mini is not a bad choice. That's all for now though, if you enjoyed this video be sure to like, subscribe, and follow me over on Twitter. And until next time, stay retro.